Hello and welcome to Archie Corner. This is episode number 21, and today we will be discussing the ADA and IBC requirements for stairs. By the way, this topic was suggested by our viewer Marbe Designs. Thank you, Marbe. Hopefully that was pronounced right. If not, our apologies. If you guys like this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and please subscribe. It helps so much. If you're watching this video and wish to see any videos on other topics not already covered in Archie Corner, please let us know. This is the second video completed as a viewer request. Before we get started, I just want to let you know that if there's a specific item you want to look for, there is a time step in the description below, so feel free to skip to that point. So let's get started. From a code perspective, there are three types of stair layouts. There are stairs with straight runs, curved stairs, and spiral stairs. Stair requirements are a bit difficult to find because the requirements can be found in two separate locations. Most stairs are used for egress, therefore you will find some information on Chapter 10 of the IBC, which is the International Building Code. Even though many states in the USA have their own state code, most states typically base their state building code on the IBC. So the sections that you see noted here will probably match your state. Probably. No guarantees, okay? For accessibility requirements, you will need to reference the ADA. Or if your state code has an accessibility chapter, similar to how California has a chapter 11B, then you may want to reference that. For the purposes of this video, we're going to be focusing on the ADA. If this statement confuses you a little, look at the video that is coming up on your screen now. That will help explain things a little. Now let's address a simple but important question. When does a change in level become a stair? In other words, is it one step? Is it two steps? And why is this important? Well, let us first answer why this is important. When designing a stair, there are usually other requirements associated with stairs, such as handrails. Therefore, the question really is, do I need handrails if I only have one step? Is one step considered a stair and therefore that triggers the requirements in the code for stairs? The answer can be found in Chapter 2 of the IBC, where a stair is defined as a change in elevation consisting of one or more risers. This clearly states that as soon as you have one step or riser, then guess what? You have a stair, my friend, and you have to comply with all those requirements. I know, I'm sorry, womp womp womp, cry me a river. It sucks, I know, but that's just the way things are. Having that out of the way, let's start talking about the stairs themselves. Let's begin with some terminology. This here is a stair section. You have a bottom landing, an intermediate landing, a top landing, and the flights of stairs in between. Each section of stairs is called a stair flight or flight of stairs. Each step is made by a horizontal step and a vertical change in elevation. The horizontal step is called a tread and the vertical change in elevation is called a riser. If a tread hangs over the step below, that overlap is called a nosing. In this section, only one intermediate landing has been shown. However, an intermediate landing is not always needed, and other times you may need more than just one. Having the terminology out of the way, let's continue with the code requirements for the treads and risers. The risers are required to be 4 inches minimum and 7 inches maximum in height. The risers must be uniform in height, and the treads are required to be 11 inches minimum. The treads must also be uniform in depth, and lastly, the treads cannot slope more than 2%. The space between the risers cannot be left open. This gets interesting now because once you close that space between the risers, you have options on how you treat the leading edge of your tread. It is common to create a nosing, but know that a nosing is not necessarily required. In fact, some people may think that a nosing is a tripping hazard. Even though nosings are quite common in the US and are allowed by most if not all of the codes in the US as well. So let us look at the options for the leading edge of your tread. Option 1. No nosing. Most people don't even know that you are not required to have a nosing, but you are allowed to just not have a nosing. That means that your upper tread's leading edge does not overlap the lower tread. 
In this instance, you only have to provide a radius that is half inch max at the leading edge. Option number two. You create an angled riser with a 30 degree angle as shown. Option number three. The riser is mostly vertical, but the upper tread is curved underneath, just as shown here. Last but not least, option number four. The riser is mostly vertical, but it's beveled underneath as shown here. Interestingly, there are no requirements on the angle or chamfer size to be used in option three and four. Regardless of the option you take, if you do provide a nosing, the nosing may project one and a quarter inches maximum from the step below. Note that this is different from the ADA because the ADA allows for one and a half inches. However, most stairs are used for egress and the IBC calls for one and a quarter inches. Let's move on to handrails now. Stairs must have handrails. This is why we had that original question at the beginning of this video. This section pretty much means that even if you have one step, guess what? Your stairs need handrails. End of story. Sorry, womp womp womp. Looking at it from a plan view, handrails must be provided on both sides of the stair, with some exceptions that we're not really gonna get into. Let's go back to the elevation on this. The top of the gripping surface must have between 34 inches minimum and 38 inches maximum vertical clearance above the walking surface or stair nosing. Let's talk about this section a little bit. First, let's make it clear that when measured along a stair flight, the handrail height is measured from the stair nosing. Second, these height allowances do not mean that you can start a handrail at 34 inches at the top, and then by the time you get down below, it can be at 38 inches. This is not the case, and it's something that happens all the time. So be careful. I see this happen so much, it's not even funny. The ADA states clearly, that handrails must be at a consistent height above stair nosings. This means that once you select the height, whether it is 34 inches, 38 inches, or something in between, that height must be consistent throughout the run of the flight of stairs. You may have noticed that that code at the beginning said that this vertical clearance was measured either above the walking surface or the stair nosing. When measuring the handrail height to the walking surface, that applies to extensions, which we will talk about next. The handrail must extend at the top of the stairs and bottom of the stairs. Let's start with the top. As we mentioned earlier, the heights of a handrail are measured to the nosing. Therefore, if we must keep a consistent handrail height and if the handrail must extend at the top of the stair, that horizontal extension must begin at the nosing of the highest step and continue along the walking surface, which is in reference to this code section we were talking about. The handrail must extend horizontally at the landing for 12 inches minimum. Now let's talk about extensions at the bottom. This is a tricky one because there is no nosing at the bottom landing. Also, the tread size of 11 inches that we spoke about earlier is a minimum, and as we already discussed, the treads must be uniform. Therefore, in this example, let's assume that the stairs drawn here have an 11 inch deep tread. Therefore, we must continue our handrail for the length of 11 inches to match the tread size beyond the last riser nosing. Once you provide this extension, you must terminate your handrail both at the top and at the bottom using either option. Option number one, if there is a wall or similar surface adjacent to the handrail, you may terminate it by returning it to the wall itself. Or option number two, if there is no wall or similar surface to return the handrail to, such as a rail or something of that sort, you can bring it down to the floor. Now, let's not forget about the intermediate landings. You can treat intermediate landings just as a top of a stair, bottom of a stair condition, or, as shown here, you may just make it easy and have one continuous handrail. Let's take a look at a section view of the handrail. The clearance between the handrail's gripping surface and the adjacent surface must be one and a half inches minimum. The ADA notes that handrail gripping surfaces cannot be obstructed along their tops or sides, but the bottom of the handrails may be obstructed for up to 20% of their length. Why was this written? 
Well, simply stated, you need a bracket to attach the rail to a wall, and you can have one, but it must be attached to the bottom of the rail as shown here to meet the requirements. Likewise, the handrail support bracket or any other horizontal projection must have one and a half inches clear below the bottom of the handrail's gripping surface. Although it is very rare to see handrails that are not purely circular in cross section, know that you do in fact have options for the profile of your handrail. If it is circular, the outside diameter must be between one and a quarter inches minimum and two inches maximum. If it is not circular, there is a perimeter requirement. The perimeter must be between four inches minimum and six and a quarter inches maximum. There is also a cross section requirement. The handrail must be two inches maximum. So you can see how that can apply in different profiles as shown here. Moving on to the vertical clearance requirements along stairs. This clearance must be a minimum of 80 inches and is normally measured from the edge of each nosing. This is usually addressed, but one location to look at carefully, the lowest floor where the stairs terminate. This area is so often overlooked. Be sure to provide a barrier, whether it is a chain, a rail, or something, so that a person does not hurt their head underneath a stair. This is very typical at the ground floor where the stairs end, so keep an eye out for that. Now let's talk about the width of the stairs. If you have been paying attention, you will have noticed that all the sections so far have been calling out mostly ADA sections. This means that so far we have been focusing on accessibility. However, because stairs are normally also used for egress and are often your only means of egress, the width of the stairs will usually be governed by Chapter 10 of the IBC. Figuring out the width for a stair used for egress is not very difficult, but it may be a bit tedious and time consuming. Let's first talk about the minimums. If a stair is not part of an accessible means of egress, it can be 36 inches minimum for an occupant load of 50 or less. Otherwise, it must be a minimum of 44 inches. However, in order for a stair to be considered part of an accessible means of egress, a stair must be a minimum width of 48 inches. This measurement can be taken in two ways. If the building's not sprinklered, the measurement is taken between handrails. But if the building is sprinklered throughout with an automatic sprinkler system, or if the stairway is accessed from a refuge area in conjunction with the horizontal exit, then the 48 inches clear can be the clear of the stairs themselves. However, you should always check because 48 inches may not be enough. 48 inches is only a minimum. This takes us to the second method, which is basing stair width on occupancy load. How do you find that out? First, you need to know how many occupants need access to that stair for egress. If you do not know how to figure out the occupant load of an area, you can watch the video that is popping up on your screen right now. There will also be a link to this at the end of the video. Once you know how many occupants need to access your stair, you simply multiply that occupancy load by 0.3 inches. If the stairs serve more than one story, have in mind that you only need to consider individual floors when used in calculating the required width. In other words, you do not need to calculate your floor plus the floor above it plus the floor above it and so on. No, only the individual floor is calculated in this regard. There are exceptions to this 0.3 inch factor. Sometimes you can use 0.2 inches. If your building has an automated sprinkler system and has an emergency voice alarm system, or if the facility has smoke protected assembly seating, or if the facility has open air assembly seating. So if any of these describe your facility, look at those exceptions. Moving on, chapter 10 also addresses landings. A flight of stairs is not allowed to go up higher than 12 feet. That is how you find out if you need an intermediate landing or not. If you need to go higher than 12 feet, you will be required to have at least one intermediate landing depending on how high you go. All stairs have a top landing and a bottom landing. The requirements for both landings are the same and are as follow. 
The width of the landing is simple. It must be as wide as the stairs themselves. That's easy. And the length of the landing is also simple. The length must be the same as the stair width or 48 inches, whichever is greater. Something very interesting here is that if you read the IBC commentary, it notes that this section is not intended to have square landings. Instead, it is intended to have a path of travel that continues the minimum width of your stairway. Therefore, in theory, you may have curved landings. Was this news to you? I'm interested in hearing your comments. Leave a comment below if this was new to you. Anyway, moving on. If you have a door at the landing, the door must not reduce the landing to less than one half of the required width. When fully open, the door must not project more than seven inches into a landing. And last, in regards to the landings, landings cannot exceed 2% slope. All right, guys, we're almost there. Just a couple of random things that are also required is that stair treads and landings subject to wet conditions, usually at exterior locations, they need to be designed to prevent the accumulation of water. And last but not least, this is actually not a requirement, but a best practices item. Visual contrasting stripes are not required by the ADA. However, DOJ advises placement of visual contrast on tread nosings or at the leading edges of treads that do not have a nosing so that the stair treads are more visible for people, which kind of makes sense. I know that in California where I live, visual contrasting stripes are a requirement. All right, and now we are done. Take a look at all the stuff we went over. Thank you for sticking around to the end. It is much appreciated. If you like this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe today. Tell your friends about me. Share this video. Hopefully others can find it useful too. Here are some videos that I think you may like, including some of the info referenced in the video today. But for now, this is Archie Corner signing out.